I will be reading Hebrews 9, verses 11 through 14. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Good morning. Yeah, just as soon as I find my notes, there we go. All right. <laughs> you know, you go over a sermon all week, you you develop it and you kind of live with it, but you show up on Sunday mornings without your, your notes and it would be like uh, losing a security blanket. Let's begin with a prayer. Our God and our Father, we, we lift your name up. God, we humbly draw before you and ask for your blessing as we look into your word and seek your will. We pray that as we look into your word, that we will accept it humbly to allow you to implant it into our hearts and into our lives. Father, we, we don't want to just know your word and know your will. We want to live it. We want it to rule over us as you rule over us through it. We just pray for your blessing as we seek this. Pray in Christ. Amen. When the great king David became king, there was something missing. Now, there were a lot of things missing. There were a lot of things that were out of whack because of Saul, his, his predecessor. One of the ones that is still, to me, it's kind of shocking is that the Ark of the Covenant was not with God's people. The Ark of God's Covenant with His covenant people was not with them. And so, after David had been in power and in place for longer than I would have thought. Then he decided it's time to go get the ark. And so David decided that the best thing to do, because this is an important thing, is to get a new cart. Not, not some old cart that's carried out. I mean, this is a brand new cart. It's never been used for anything else. And on this cart, he puts... You know, David had mighty men, the mighty men of David. It's, it's almost mythical now, but really, I mean, he had these men who were willing to sacrifice their lives to go get him a drink of water from a well. They were his men. I mean, they were bonded. And he put two of his great mighty men to drive this cart. And so they, they loaded the, the ark they put it on the cart and they start off to take it to, to the, its rightful place. And, and before the cart, it sounds almost like this party. There's, there's music and there's dancing and there's celebration going on. And it's this great, great day for Israel to get back the Ark of the Covenant. Until the oxen stumble. They do that. And as they did, it, it, of course, it jerked the cart and, and the ark was starting to slide. And, and a well-intentioned, faithful man reached back to steady the ark. And he was struck dead. Depending on the translation, either God's anger grew or God waxed angry. It was 
Uzzah, this, this great leader, this great man who reached out to steady that cart and he was lost immediately. And immediately something happened. Fear gripped David. The king, the ruler of Israel, the, the, the highest guy there, right? And he was gripped with fear. They stopped. They, they parked it somewhere and they went on back home. They left it. It wasn't in its rightful place. The thing that, that David had intended to do wasn't accomplished, but he was done. He wasn't taking any more chances. And it sat there for about three months. And guess what David did? Apparently, over those three months, he had did a little reading. He had done a little research. He figured something out. And he called the Levites, the men who were supposed to be moving the cards. And they went and put it on their shoulders and brought it back, put it in the, the tabernacle that David had set up. Everything went perfectly. Why? What was the difference? The first one seems like it was, it was, it was a bigger deal. It was, it was more exciting. But the second time pleased God. What was the difference? Well, the first time, it was David's idea. It was David's plan. It was David's way. And the second time was God's way. God had a plan. He set it forth from the time that he, he told them to build the ark. Told them what to put in it. It wasn't a big party. It was just what God commanded and it was it was perfect well that is how we have to approach i i love the song selection this morning like like roger said it's we didn't get together we don't do that but still we serve a mighty god we draw before in prayer before a mighty God, we come together this morning before a mighty God. We enter into his presence in this worship. So first thing that we have to figure out is we do things by God's plan and not ours. I think we can, if, if Uzzah isn't that, then, then we could give a dozen more examples, right, of of people who kind of did the right thing, might have had good intentions, but did it in the wrong way. And many met the same fate as, as us. How do we establish a covenant with God? See, that was, the, that was the whole meaning of the ark. That was the whole reason they wanted to put it back in place is because they were the covenant people of God. But how do you become the covenant people of God? For them, it was really, well about this much of your Bible, right? Um, it's kind of a long story, but it comes down to God chose his people and God made them holy and God set them apart and made them a mighty nation. Well, God in the new covenant, the, the covenant, the testament, which as David was talking about, that was the covenant that he, he gave his life blood to enact. It's the covenant in his blood. When we take the fruit of the vine every Sunday morning, that's what, we're, that's what we're going back to, is this is the covenant in his blood. Well, how do we get into that covenant? Because we're not born to a certain family. We're not born in a certain place, and we don't undergo certain things as children. We have to do it the way that he commands. He has rejected sacrifices he has rejected people he's rejected nations he has rejected worship he's rejected all these things on the basis of they were not done as he commanded the covenant which we get the honor of becoming partakers in is purchased Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, it's purchased by his blood. 
his lifeblood. I hear people talk about oh, making a blood oath and different things like that. And what they're talking about is making a little cut or, or, or just squeezing out a little bit of blood. This was his lifeblood. If you go back to Genesis, that idea is there from the beginning. It's not just his blood that he shed blood. It's that he gave his life blood for the life of the man was in his blood. God established that. It's purchased by his blood and entrance into that covenant cannot be done any way except the way that Jesus Christ himself said. And in Matthew, I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, in Mark chapter 16, he is talking about that, that covenant. He's talking about how to become partakers in that. And in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, it says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. We can pile all the human wisdom on top of that that we want. We can talk about how, well, this is the beginning, but it changed later. How on earth are we going to say that the words of Jesus Christ changed? How are we going to say that he said that, but that does, that's not what he meant? Do you think Uzzah, when he was riding on that cart, knew that he wasn't supposed to touch the ark? But surely if it was sliding off, he didn't really mean it, right? As soon as human wisdom overcomes the will of God, we die. Uzzah died physically. We die spiritually. As soon as we go against the covenant that we have with God, as soon as we decide that we are going to, to figure out how to enact that, when we decide that we know better than he, entrance is simple. We can make it as convoluted as we want, but it's not what Jesus said. He said, go preach the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, at its heart, it is the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's a lot to it, but at its heart, that's what it is. That's the core of it. How do we obey the gospel? We follow Jesus Christ into his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We go through that with him and enter into that covenant that he established. How? In baptism, it's what it says. When Peter was asked by a group of men whom he had just laid the blood of Christ at their feet and said, this is your responsibility. This blood is on your hands. They said, what do we do? What did he say? He didn't say, well, Jesus said this, but I'm pretty sure that what it really means, what we really know, Peter, a Holy Spirit inspired apostle of Jesus Christ who heard him say this, said the same thing. We establish our covenant with God the way he says to. How do we worship God? Mm. John 4, 24, Jesus, when asked, Basically, how do we worship God? He said, what? Well, he said, God is spirit. And those who worship him will worship him. In spirit and in truth. What does that mean? Well, God is spirit. We worship him in spirit. It's not something just physical. It's something deeper. It's something more. And how else? In truth. What does that mean? Jesus said he's the truth. What is the truth? The truth? We know the truth that will set us free. What is the truth? And the truth is what he says it is. In Hebrews chapter 12, let's look over there in, in Hebrews chapter 12. Let's look at verses 28 and 29. Let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God 
is a consuming fire. Is this Old Testament God? Our God is a consuming fire. That, that doesn't sound New Testament, does it? Ah, Y'all know I hate it when people put that in there. It's the same God, always has been, always will be. Our God is a consuming fire. So when we draw before Him, when we draw into His presence to worship Him, there is something that's said here. It says with acceptable worship. What does that mean? If there is acceptable worship, what does there necessarily have to be? There has to be unacceptable worship, doesn't there? What is it? What's well, lacking this reverence, this awe? It's lacking doing what he said, how he says to do it. And if we come before God and we worship him in a way that is unacceptable, what's the result of that? Is he going to accept it? Is he going to say, well, they have good intentions. I mean, I mean, look at how joyous they are. That's great. I love that. That's good enough. I, I've read from Genesis to the maps, and you know what I haven't found? It's good enough. Close enough. That's okay. I haven't found that. You know what God demands every time, all the time, is what he commands. He demands what He commands. He makes the commandments. He lays it out for us. Mm. But it is up to us to accept and to submit. In Revelation, over and over and over, we see the scenes before the throne of God. And what do the people do over and over and over again when they worship? There's a word, there's something that comes just before worship. They fall down. They don't kneel. They don't bow slightly. They fall down on their face before God and worship. Mm. I understand that Revelation is a highly symbolic book. I don't believe that we have to be face down to, to worship our God physically. But you know what we had better be? We'd better be face down on the ground before our God worshiping Him in spirit. That's, that's acceptable. Guess anything else that, that falls short of that? Guess what it's not? It's not acceptable. There is no record of, well, God said this, but I like it this way. And, and if I take this text and I spend long enough dissecting it, I can take something in there and, and plug a few things in and pull a few things out and I can make it mean what I want it to mean and, and God accepting that. I don't find it one single time. And guess what? We are before God now. In fact, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, guess where we always are? If God is the almighty, all-knowing, creator God of our universe, <laughs> we listen to him. How do we serve God? There was a problem in Romans 1. Well, there's several problems in Romans 1, but let's go take a look right quick. In Romans chapter 1, first he gives us the solution. I love that. First he gives us the answer, and then he gives us the problem. In Romans chapter 1, we see that Paul is a minister of the gospel, that the gospel saves, that grace by faith saves. But who does it not save? Well, they're called the unrighteous. In this text, they go by a lot of names, but see, there's a problem with attitude. Let's look at uh, verses 24 and 25. It says, therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creator I mean, the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. 
They worshiped and served not God. The, the creature instead of the creator, the created thing instead of the one who created it, which deserves worship? Well, we know. Mm, but what about service? It says they're serving the creature rather than the creator too. They're joined together. In fact, they're joined together in several places. But they're closely related. We better get them both right. We, we worship God together and we serve one another before God. Who do we serve? <laughs> Jesus described a neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Well, it was some random person who, who came into contact with this guy who needed help. Who's our neighbor? Y'all, it's whoever we come into contact with that needs help. That's how we serve God. We serve God by serving His people. And that includes His people who are His people. And it also includes those people who He created who are not His people in order to make them His people, to show them the love of God. In Romans chapter 12, verses, we're going to begin in verse 9. Romans 12, where, where Paul, by Holy Spirit inspiration, takes all the things he's been talking about and starts plugging them into real life. He, he starts putting flesh on it and, and make, showing you what it looks like. Beginning in verse 9, it says, let love be genuine. Pour what is evil and hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Mm. Love. Love. Show hospitality. Love. Mm. Serve the Lord with zeal, with fervor, with real energy, y'all. We worship and we serve together to contribute to the needs and to show hospitality, to let our love show. How does God mean to do it? He tells us how. And it's, it's not by lip service, is it? He says, love, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil and hold to what is good. Cling to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. <laughs> Outdo one another. It's, we're, we're having a competition now. Better watch out. Outdo one another. No matter how much somebody loves you, try to love them more. No matter how much somebody shows their love for you, try to show them more. That's how we're called to serve God. God has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. He has a plan for us. That we submit completely to Him. That we worship and serve with all humility. God instructs us and He means it. God gives us these, these commands, these things that are so high and so lofty. How, how on earth can we accomplish that? Mm. By imitating Him. By walking as He walked. Anything less than full submission is never accepted. We don't know better than Him. We can't know better than him. We can't know as well as he knows. We had best listen. I love every one of you. Every one of you who are here, who are out there, and I don't want to see anyone come to the end that us have had. I don't want the fear to grip us like David did because we didn't listen in the first place. 
We have to spend time in prayer. We have to spend time in study. And we have to take it seriously. This morning, if you haven't established that covenant with God as he commanded, you can do that. If you haven't studied and and don't understand what the gospel is, there are dozens and dozens of people here who would love to study. If you need that, if you need prayers of your brothers and sisters to lift you up, to help drive you on to that light that we're called to, if you have any need, please come as we stand and sing.